sponsor for this event is Access One. Access One is a patient financing solution that provides consumer focused experience which drives patient satisfaction to their clients. They've helped over 1 million consumers afford out of pocket medical expenses for health systems nationwide. And they also offer the most comprehensive platform in the industry with funding models that help providers and programs that reach more patients. Thank you, Access One, for your sponsorship in the Oregon chapter. So this session is pursuing the less commonly recognized payer by Sean Minol. Um, Sean is from Great Falls, Montana and graduated from Great Falls College of Mon uh, Montana State University with a degree in criminal justice and psychology. He's got 30 years of experience, including positions in the US Senate state aid legal investigator for the prestigious law firm, or firm of Church and Harris Johnson and Williams and consumer fraud and collection officer of IT&T, senior staff subrogation director of a state insurance company and executive director of third party liability for med data before accepting the position of vice president of risk management for the IRRG. Sean specializes in management of complex hospital reimbursement claims and in addition to educating employees and investigation technique. One key thing to note about Sean is he does volunteer puppy sit, sitter for a canine companions and the guide dogs for a blind. Welcome Sean to the Oregon chapter. Hey, thanks Tammy, sure appreciate it. Good afternoon everybody. Um, first thing we're gonna touch on uh, is the, the screening process when a patient comes into the facility. But before we get into that, the only homework I'm gonna give you is tonight I want everybody to go home and read one of your insurance policies front to back. You uh, will realize what the policy is probably more applicable for and find some things it does and does not cover. Um, the other thing is, as we initiate this, the, the beginning of the presentation here, I'm gonna uh, touch on contracts and before everybody groans, it's gonna be short uh, on the contracts and if you think contracts are boring, just get on the wrong side of one. They, uh, they can be quite entertaining. So anyhow, um, initial part when a patient comes into the hospital is the foundation to, to reimbursement. And that, that is the proper screening. And there's two reasons or it's twofold why we do that. One, the initial screening will act as an account guide to the reimbursement. And two, if you screen out every payer, there isn't any coverage liability or damages, get to the hospital and get it off their AR as quick as you can so they don't end up sitting there with some, like, with a red herring on their, their AR for a long period of time. Contractually, what triggers a coverage is the, the litmus test is a, an event has to be sudden and accidental. To give an example of a valid denial for a, if you're doing a stimulus or a litmus test regarding uh, a coverage is if somebody is repetitively doing the same thing over and over. And a lot of times you'll see this in work comp. You'll see somebody like Carpenter that's using a hammer all the time. All of a sudden they develop issues with their wrist. That long-term repetitive claim rather than a sudden and accidental event is, is, excluded. And the reason for that is you don't really know what date it occurred, possible subrogation or other factors come into play. And you don't have, you, you have no way to identify other contributing factors. So as the claim progresses and you're initiating all of your screening processes, there are four components to every reimbursement equation that dictate whether or not you're going to hit pay dirt with an insurance contract. That's establishing a patient's status, coverage, liability, and damages. If you're able to screen and identify those items, you're going to hit pay dirt from an insurance policy. So let's get into a patient's status. Patients can have numerous status. They can have a mixture of them. It's the most important thing when you're identifying to the provider in the diary be accurate and brief and be sure and tie the, the description together when you're identifying something of, I, I don't like using scripts, but something of a nature of the operator of a vehicle he or she owned and is the named insured of. 
be sure and identify their status appropriately, whether they're the pilot of an airplane or a pilot of a tugboat is going to make a big difference. Because certain items will be excluded simply because of a person's status, don't just throw them out right away and don't be too quick to discount them. Even trespassers have rights. We've hit pay dirt and had successful claims for patients who have accidentally accessed private property because it was not legally identified as required by the statute in the state where it occurred. And you can have what's called an attractive nuisance that, that enhances the person onto the property when the event occurred also. Next slide we're gonna to touch on here, the next area is coverage. I just made a brief list and you can use your imagination. There's all sorts of additional coverages out there. And if you look to all the available coverages, it's tough not to find somebody with a first party contract that doesn't have some form of indemnification or a third party exposure. The one item I want to be sure and touch on, because everybody always has a question about it, if you've never heard of a broad form policy, that is an insurance policy that you purchase and you put it in your wallet and it will cover you wherever whatever vehicle you're operating for liability only. You'll see a lot of used car operators, used car dealerships with what's called a broad form. It doesn't provide any first party coverages, but it gives you liability coverage in case you run into somebody else. To give you just a short example of how specific some coverage have become within the insurance industry, as pets, especially during the pandemic, have become more and more prevalent, Pet insurance commercial coverage, some policies split into two different types of, of coverages, one for accident only and two for illness only. Be sure if you have an animal and be sure if you're looking into those policies that you read those and make certain that they have the proper coverage. It's better to buy a universal, um, but, and then secondary to that, for those people that like exotic animals like tigers, probably don't have any coverage in your homeowner's policy if the tiger gets next door and eats the kid next door. Um, you have to purchase a separate extended liability coverage. And even that coverage has an escape clause that you have to purchase separately in case the animal gets out of its cage and goes and does some damages. So the next uh, item we're going to touch base on is liability. And specifically what we're looking at here are the first party coverages. And anytime you're conducting the screening process, that first diary entry within the caption of coverage and status, coverage, liability, and damages should be first party contractual in event at the time of the loss and then identify what it is. That's really important because with MedPay, those medic, those, that coverage is specific to medical expenses. And the important reason for identifying it right up front and making certain you identify or you evaluate it appropriately for the circumstances is because most of the time med pay coverage has a pretty tight timeline within certain medical expenses have to be submitted. So whether the policy allows for prepayment of future medical expenses, if, this, if the statute to present medical expenses is a concern, a lot of times that comes into play with somebody who has an accident they have some injuries and they're going to have a, an operation or follow-up care a year or two years down the road. You might be able to use, if it's allowed within the policy, using that medical coverage, the med pay no fault to prepay those medical expenses before the, the coverage uh, lapses on that med pay coverage. With PIP, really important to recognize the, and get the bill in early because unlike med pay that's specific to medical expenses, PIP is used for numerous exposures such as wage loss, loss of services, death benefits, funeral expenses. So if you submit a medical expense after a patient submits a wage loss, you're probably, you're, you're probably not going to end up with much left. While during the screening, identifying uninsured and underinsured coverages can assist with the coordination benefits or the deductible and co-pays with commercial health insurance. And usually your commercial health insurance won't trigger until after the no-fault coverages are exhausted, depending on the contract and depending on the state. But general rule of thumb is until you provide 
a no fault EOB that depicts that coverage is, is exhausted, your, your commercial health is not going to trigger. One thing a little bit unique about Oregon's no fault is that most other states, in fact, every other state that I'm aware of states that covered under no fault is the named insured, resident relatives and occupants of the vehicle. Oregon's a little bit, bit different. It's named insured resident relatives, but it's passengers specifically and not occupants of the vehicle. So if you have a neighbor driving your vehicle and he piles it up and gets hurt, he's probably not going to have coverage under an Oregon no-fault policy unless he has coverage himself. But it's, that one word makes a change in the difference of how that coverage is applied. Um, going on to damages, two types. There's general damages and specials. Your general damages are very subjective. It's the pain and suffering, the mental anguish and all that. Whereas special damages are objective. You can assign an amount to it. Medical expenses, 15,000. Wage loss, 10,000 or whatever. And again, remember with that wage loss, that's gonna be covered under your PIP and it can infringe on your ability to recover medical expenses. Um, what else is gonna to touch on? I think that was everything I wanted to touch on there. So next we're gonna go into the type of accounts and there's two types and that's it. Either the file is organized in chronological order from beginning to end or it's disorganized. And the reason it's so important to organize them in chronological order is you're gonna miss something along the way if you don't. So immediately right off the bat, if the foundation to the event, of course, is the accident report. And if you have this event occur where they go, where you're applying for or looking for an accident report and it's, you're being told it doesn't exist, don't buy it. I don't care if it's aviation, automobile, industrial, you got to think a little bit outside the box on locating these reports. And if you have to go backwards in the chronology of events, starting with the ground ambulance or private delivery directly from the accident scene to an air a heliopad where they were brought in by air ambulance, whether the patient was brought in by private delivery, transferred from another facility, doesn't make any difference. You have to work backwards from these events to locate that accident report. And the report does more than just identify how the injury was incurred and, and the involved parties. It establishes the jurisdictional liability laws and the county where the accident occurred. And that's important because some states require liens to be filed in the county where the accident occurred in addition to the county where the hospital is located. I know some of these processes aren't easy. I, some of them take a lot of time but I've resorted to tracking down helicopter pilots to access their flight data log to find out where they pick somebody up out on the freeway to, to find out what jurisdiction, which highway patrol or which state patrol or sheriff's office picked them up. Um, going backwards and tracking down the tow truck that, that removed the vehicle from the scenes, another way of doing that. It's a little bit more arduous and a little bit more difficult because the medical reports from the air ambulance are right there usually in the record, whereas the the tow truck, you're going to have some more, more running around to do to track them down, but it's just another idea of a way to do that. Again, touching on the organizational methodology, the reason for organizing these accounts in the manner we do is to make certain we don't miss any coverages, making certain we maximize the recovery, and in doing so, it mitigates the damages the patient has to shoulder going out the door. Again, doing all this gives the client, i.e. the provider, a snapshot of the account condition without being required to read and interpret and evaluate all the conditions. It makes it much easier for them to take a glance into the file and consider it for charity or when we're putting together a, 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 a synopsis of some type in proposing a compromise settlement. If they're able to just glance in there and look at all these different types of data and documents we have in place, they don't have to go looking for them. The next group is another portion of the organizational methodology, and it's more what I refer to as the organizational uh, coordination of benefits. The reason it's important to touch on these, and, and I'm going to touch on a little bit more later on in the presentation with a specific example, 
where you have commercial health and in health, commercial health controlled by an ERISA plan, you're going to have two different forms of application to those. One, generally commercial health doesn't have a subrogation clause in there, whereas the, the subrogation clause is built right into the ERISA plan types of coverages. Your other three areas within that that you're going to be touching on during this organization will be for the uninsured, where you automatically file a lien because there's no other way to encumber a payment. And then areas where you're barred from that, and that'd be workers' comp and FELA, like for railroad, railroad workers. Again, part of the, the offshoot and or the benefit of, of conducting this process the provider takes a glance in there and then considers it for charity care, financial aid, or the reason we're negotiating some form of a settlement. Um, next thing we're going to touch on are some examples of some coverages that just give you kind of an idea of thinking outside the box where we were able to hit pay dirt and re make recoveries. The first area there is under the victims of crime. We had a young man who brought a pistol over to a friend of his apartment. The two of them start twirling around like they're Wyatt Earp. The gun hits the ground, the shot goes off and our patient takes one in the chest. No coverage of any nature. The, the patient didn't have any type of commercial health insurance. And the gentleman that owned the gun didn't have any form of homeowners or, or renters insurance. But during the process of screening, we found out he was a felon. And as a felon in uh, possession of a gun, um, he was arrested as a result of it, but it automatically triggered victims of crime to, to help pay for the patient's medical expenses at the facility. The other example, um, we had a patient who was walking across the street. He was struck by a car, all was kosher until the car left the scene. But as soon as that occurred, it automatically triggered his ability or his eligibility for, uh, for victims of crime when that, that vehicle fled the scene. So, Exposures aren't required to proceed the, the uh, event. They may be post-event uh, to trigger the exposures. Um, one of the things that's really, really frustrating, I'm sure everybody's come across this, they pick up a file that's a year old and they see the first comment in there is, the patient says, I just lost my job or my husband just lost his job. When you're screening and COBRA is in play, immediately getting that coverage in place. And, you know, even if at the facility or we have to step in and pay for the premium to bring it current, it's generally well worth it. And you have to remember the principal, the actual named insured or the principal beneficiary or the principal is not required to trigger coverage for beneficiaries. So if the employee is the husband the wife ends up being hospitalized. He doesn't need to apply for coverage. The beneficiary, the wife or his children are able to. And the last thing to remember with COBRA and the insurers really get this wrong. COBRA isn't designed to exclude people. It's, in, it's designed to include eligible members and make certain that they have indemnification for as long in the process as possible. And when you're doing all of this, especially with COBRA, you have to do your own homework. There's a case where an individual was terminated from a position. He applied for COBRA and was told he was not eligible. As a result of the injuries he sustained and the reason he was hospitalized and attempted to apply for COBRA, uh, he passed away. His estate took a look at the file and they identified he was in fact eligible and HR had advised him incorrectly. The courts came back and said, you got to run your own railroad. Um, they did not allow the coverage and um, the estate lost in the case. Um, the other example I was going to give you about intermediaries involved with claims. Original Medi-Cal for children's CCS, Children's Services in California, are run through a mediary by, called MMIS. It's California Medicaid Management Information System. They're a, a fiscal intermediary area that requires every child that's admitted within six months after the month of care has to be identified. Medi-Cal's one year for timely filing. If it's covered under the physical intermediary statutes, which is the children's correct, the children's services, 
it's six months after the date of services. So be careful if you come across that. Going to touch on denials next. Um, and I know this is going to shock everybody's conscience, but sometimes insurance adjusters improperly deny coverage. Um, we try to do our best to make certain and guide them into keeping a clean conscience. Um, just a couple of outside examples really quick. Best friend of mine was driving his vehicle. It's driving down the road and it just puked, just stopped. Um, had the vehicle towed and it was a large tow bill because of where he was. His insurance company denied coverage for the tow, even though it was identified uh, on his deck sheet, stating that it requires a traffic accident before the, the coverage is in place. And I contacted the insurer and said, you show me where in the policy, it says it has to be a motor vehicle accident to trigger coverage. There wasn't any. Um, it's just one of those frustrating kind of things that don't take uh, the no up front real quickly. Um, another one we get to see a lot of is that first example in the intoxication injuries, we get people who come into the hospital and their commercial health insurer denies coverage because they were intoxicated at the time of the loss. There's two distinct types of coverage. And if you remember we're at the front of the presentation, I was talking about sudden and accidental to trigger coverage. Well, here's an example. The first one is direct, it's what's considered to be direct injury by the courts, and there's no coverage for that. An example of that would be somebody who drinks themselves over a long-term period of time until they get cirrhosis of the liver and die from it. That is a huge difference in comparing to somebody who gets intoxicated and steps in front of a vehicle and gets run over. So just because somebody's intoxicated doesn't mean they don't have any coverage, and you have to look to the policy to find out whether or not those two types of coverages or exposures are distinctly identified. The second event down there is the example of denied no-fault coverages. We had a, a group of kids walking along Coast Highway and a vehicle lost control the other direction, ended up coming over to where these kids were walking along the road. Our patient was one of them. He jumped over a guardrail and dislocated his shoulder. The insurer, the patient's first party insurer denied coverage stating that their policy required actual contact between the vehicle and the car or the vehicle and the patient, <laughs> which means you'd have to stand there waiting to get run over in order to trigger coverage. So we came back to them and we stayed, listen, if they were to do that, if they were to stay there and wait until the vehicle actually struck them to make contact to trigger coverage, then it would be excluded or denied because they failed to mitigate the damages. They agreed with us and they went and had and covered the loss. The second bullet point there is debris in the roadway. We had a young man riding a motorcycle north on I-5 late at night. Couch fell out of the back of someone's vehicle, a black leather couch, and he hit it. He was badly injured. And they denied he, he filed a, a med pay claim, which was minor, but he had a large UM UIM policy. And they denied coverage and contact the adjuster. And I said, you identify the insurer of the couch and we'll go ahead and process the claim. They couldn't do it. So they went ahead and supported um, the coverage under the UM, UM coverage for him. The last bullet point, and this is for whatever reason becoming more and more prevalent is the, the insurer is denying coverage for late notice. Um, the reason for late notice is, is a request. It's not there to, to allow insurers a technical escape hatch. It's to make certain that insurers aren't prejudiced by their inability to subrogate or to, or to investigate the loss. We had a young gal in the hospital who was badly injured in a motor vehicle accident. She was uh, in the hospital three or four days in ICU. She got out, uh, it was about a day later before she called and identified the accident to the commercial health insurer. And it was about two hours outside the 24 hour window that they're required. And the insurer tried to deny coverage. There's some really specific, it was in California and there's some real hard case law that was in our, in our side for this, but it was just another example of she had kind of conceded that she had violated the policy technically by missing the deadline by two hours. And um, we turned it around and, and still haven't been paid in that claim, but it's looking better all the time. And it's got nothing to do with the coverage. It's got to do with some delays on, on the insurer themselves. So um, 
if you take a look at the next slide, it, just some examples of how uh, valid denials can come apart, can, can come together. Um, one of the examples, and I was going to remove this because we're so close to the end of COVID and because the insurers during COVID have supported coverage for turning a passenger vehicle into a commercial delivery. But if you look at the difference in risk, whenever you change risk on a policy, you're endangering that coverage. I put some examples and the one I gave, uh, the second one I gave there is regarding if you have a motorcycle or four or five of them being towed on a trailer versus being driven down the road, the chances of something happening to all those motorcycles at the same time is far greater than if they're driving down the road together. Anytime you change a risk, you're really, you're really, really endangering a chance of that you're going to be challenged on coverage if something were to, to occur. The last bullet point is just an example on premise liability. If, if you take a look at it, there's zero coverage under your homeowner's insurance for wedding reception and for good reason. There's a big difference between a neighborhood barbecue being held in your front yard and a home and on the, on the other side of the coin, a home full of intoxicated wedding celebrants that are from all over the country. Your neighbors are probably going to walk home if, if the worst thing that happens, they'll trip and fall. Whereas where you have a bunch of intoxicated wedding celebrants, they're going to be at your house late. They're going to be leaving. Um, the chance of them striking somebody else and ending up with a dram shop claim. And for those of you who aren't familiar with a dram shop claims, is a, is a civil liability imposed on a party providing intoxicants to an intoxicated person. Then that intoxicated person drives down the road and hits somebody or hurts somebody. That person, that third party has a, uh, has a, a stand to come back and sue you for feeding the intoxicated individual uh, the beverages. So you might think about that when you're having a party at your house, be very, very cautious of it. And it doesn't do any good to hang a big sign on the, the refrigerator that says, bring your own booze. That's almost acknowledging the risk. Um, the next one is the one I just referred to that I was going to leave out. During the, the COVID pandemic, because of the requirements of people being <laughs> having medical supplies and pharmacy, groceries, all sorts of different, uh, different items delivered, Almost every insurer I'm aware of changed it so delivery so you could return a vehicle from a passenger car to a delivery vehicle. That is going away in the near future as this pandemic uh, recedes and as we return to our senses. Um, that is, I'm sure, going to go away. But for at least for the time being, and we didn't see any insurers try and deny coverage under the first party types of exposures. Um, so most of them got the message out up front right away that, that even though a vehicle was being used for delivery and there's a specific exclusion in the policy for that, um, they were still providing indemnification. Moving on to the next, this is probably something a lot of people are not really familiar with. Um, give you a little example of what logo liability is. And this is a case we were actually involved with. We had a large retail company moving their product with their name, i.e. their logo, on the container. They leased one of those great big trailers to place the container on to move the product. The retailer then required the trailer lease and the adhesion contract, and we'll touch on that next, the trailer lease contained an indemnity clause indemnifying the retailer from any liability. So now you have the, the logo uh, container on a lease, leased trailer, and they've, they've signed an indemnification agreement. Then the trailer leasing company leased a truck to pull the trailer. <laughs> and within that was an indemnification clause stating that the truck pulling the trailer is going to be liable for any damages. The truck company then hired a driver, a driver who was our patient, and he signed a lease agreement, no different than renting a vehicle, which contained an adhesion clause accepting liability for any of the damages uh, occurring during the transfer period. So you've got the retailer indemnified by the trailer lease. You've got the trailer indemnified by the truck lease. And you have the truck indemnified by the operator who doesn't have a plug nickel to his name. 
So the courts have stepped in and said, if you're going to, if that, if you're, that vehicle is going to have that, your logo on the side of it, and it is required to be identified, then there's a presumption that that employee is the, that's his status. He is an actual employee and it has some far reaching events because logo liability compelled the truck driver and the operator status as an employee. Now he's covered by workers' compensation and he's immune from those nonsense adhesion clauses that points the, the, the retailer at the leasing company at the, the trailer and on and on down the road. Within all of this, you might run into something called a vicarious liability claim. And here's an example, a real simple one of what vicarious liability is. If you as a homeowner hire a little kid to mow your lawn and he chucks a rock through your neighbor's window, the neighbor doesn't sue him. That child is acting as your agent. Therefore, you become vicariously liable for his actions. Same with, with somebody who's your agent. You hire somebody, they go out and dink something up then you're going to end up being responsible for those damages as a result of the vicarious liability and relationship you have with that individual. The last thing I want to touch on really quick is to explain what an adhesion contract is. And you see these a lot when insurers go, we're not responsible. They sign this and then it's got about 35 pages of number one font that you can't read without a magnifying glass. When you're registering to go into a hotel, it's to identify yourself and to guarantee payment. If you look in the fine print there, the idea is not to give some maid approval to shoot or stab you. And I tell you, when I'm, when I'm checking it, when I'm looking at this stuff and signing things anymore, I am so careful about what I read. If I haven't got time to read it, I'm either one not signing it or I'm scratching the whole thing out. So that's kind of how all three of those fit in together between the, the exclusionary wording for the logo liability with somebody being vicariously liable between the retailer, the trailer company, and the leasing company for the truck, and then how they tie them all together with this nonsense adhesion contracts that really cause a lot of problems. The last thing I'm gonna to touch on is understanding some larger losses and exposure. Anytime you see what's called a non-delegatable duty doctrine, and I'll give you a little example, exaggerated. The doctrine is what prevents assigning a teenager that flips hamburgers in the afternoon to managing the safety program from a nuclear power plant. And then a third, Three Mile Island or Chernobyl occurs and they blame it on this, this kid that flips burgers at night. There are certain items of such huge exposure and danger, you cannot delegate them to a third person. Another example of it is, do you remember when the Costa Cordia exam, um, flipped over in the Mediterranean and the ownership blamed all the deckhands that happened to stick around and help all the people? Immediately, the courts, even in Italy, stepped in and said, no way, you're not going that route. So that gives you an idea. Anytime you have these larger losses with huge, huge exposures, when somebody starts pointing the finger at some homeowner with $100,000 of coverage, don't buy it. I can almost guarantee you Somewhere along the line, there was somebody else assigned to accept the liability and or manage the type of exposure that's in place. The second item there is what's called a certificate of waiver. And that is simply a document. If you ever see that, that is simply a document that's issued by the FAA authorizing certain operations of aircraft to deviate from regulations. Quite simply, when you obtain a certificate of waiver, you can break all the aviation rules in the world you want. And how that applies is like to air shows, such as the Oregon, Oregon Air Show, where they had a really bad accident about 10, 15 years ago, or the Reno Air Race from about five or 10 years ago. Part of the other side of the coin to the certificate of, way of obtaining the waiver is that you have to maintain and require safety conditions that make the air show 100% liable for all damage. It doesn't matter if you have a hangover or a hangnail, you're gonna be responsible for it. And most of those, the minimums I've ever seen are $100 million in coverage. So if you see somebody, if you see that certificate of waiver, get it identified, get your lien in place, identifying who writes it, and you're gonna be well on your way to probably obtaining some, some substantial reimbursement. Um, that's about everything I wanted to touch on.
Um, just in closing, um, we uh, conduct evaluations and TPL program consultations for any providers who'd like us to take a look at their process um, or obtain feedback or some guidance and recommendation. That includes working with and for your in-house or outside counsel, if we can be of assistance or if there's specifics um, that, that you come across that you might be looking for a different uh, direction or attitude on uh, regarding thinking outside the box, we'd be happy to take a look at it. Um, feel free to contact us if we can help you out in any way, shape, or form. So, 